Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome, St. Francis. Good to have you back again, as, as always. So we're on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's just announced, this is uh, towards the end of the uh, Messianic mission of Jesus. Uh, the, since this is his last, uh, we are now going to go into the uh, Passion Narratives. So uh, he has revealed himself in Mark chapter 7, 8, and 9, who he is, the long-awaited Messiah. He is the Son of Man. And what the fathers asked him to do is to uh, be at the hands and the clutches of the eldership of Israel to fulfill the ultimate destiny, uh, a providential destiny in the mind of the Father given to the Son. And the Son is going to be handed over to the Gentiles, to his own people. There he, he will be found guilty of heresy, among other things, issues of kosher, Sabbath law, prophetic oracle, messianic expectation, uh, defilement, uh, and the issue of the casting out of the evil one, as well as uh, the issues of curing the multitude. These are the issues that got Jesus into all sorts of difficulty. And now we're at the point where at Caesarea Philippi, he is announced to his 12 apostles and others that he's a long awaited Messiah. And as the Messiah, he, he is also the son of man, uh, Daniel 7, 14, that heavenly divine human figure that resides with Yahweh uh, with a myriad of angels. And he, uh, he being the son of man, in Daniel 7, 14, comes to the Ancient of Days, Yahweh, God, and God bestows upon him legitimate authority of every language, people, and nation, and he is now able to create a new image, a new kingdom, a new activity of how God is present to his creation. So the Son of Man is truly apocalyptic. Apocalyptic means revelatory and he's going to be the means by which god manifests himself to his created order through the obediential death of his son whom he loves dearly and at caesarea philippi he tells his disciples listen to my son this is my beloved son and i want you to listen to him because he's already predicted the passion twice and they're not getting it. That, that they simply don't understand that he's going to die and on the third day rise. Well, you mean, Jesus, you, you are not going to fill the sociological, ideological, political expectation of the messianic role and our kingdom, namely to rot out Herod to rout out the Roman Imperium, the uh, Gentile scourge in our land, and now be seated as Messiah, and now inaugurate in your person uh, this new messianic age where God will rule over the world through the vicarage of his Messiah. No, that's not going to happen. The only throne that Jesus is going to be sitting on is not the throne of Herod. It's the throne of the cross. That's how he's going to govern. That's the point. So the issue is, oh, Jesus, uh, are you going to fulfill the political aspirations of Israel? No. I'm going to fulfill what the fathers asked me to do. And what has he asked me to do? He's asked me to do, to sit on the cross and nullify the kingdom of Satan. He wants the effects of Satan to be nullified. And the, the key effect of Satan's kingdom is death. Disobedience by Adam and Eve toward God was the cause of death. 
and they were tempted by the evil one. So Jesus is about the utter destruction of the kingdom of the demonic. He is the powerful ruler that will uh, wrestle and hold fast demonic activity. And he will destroy death forever. So that's what he's called to do by preaching God's kingdom. He, that's the point. He's not here to rot out the Roman Imperium. Now, getting on the cross uh, takes some time. They have to have charges against Jesus. You, you cannot arbitrarily kill someone, even under Roman law. So we have Jesus now, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Now, there's a problem here because this smacks of a messianic appellation of who and what Jesus is as king of Israel. Israel already, already has a king. It's Herod. So is this some form of Galilean usurper that's trying to cast out Herod and then define his role as the long-awaited messianic Goel, the vindicator of God in messianic terms. Let's go through it. This is uh, Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, 1 through 10. This is found in Matthew 21 and Luke 19. So for our purposes, because we're dealing with Mark and tradition, it's Mark chapter 11, 1 to 10. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village. And immediately, as you enter it, you will find a tide there, a colt that has never been ridden, untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You just say, the Lord needs it, and it will be sent back here immediately. They went away and found a colt near a door outside the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying this colt? And they told them that Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought it, they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat thereupon. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were following, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus triumphantly enters Jerusalem as the son of David, which is a messianic title. This is a major issue here. <laughs> uh, what would King Herod be thinking right about now? Is this man taking over the um, kingdom of Judea? Is he trying to oust me out of my rightful monarchical place in Eretz Israel? Is he a usurper? People are saying, Hosanna to the highest. Uh, blessed is he in the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David. This is all messianic language. Uh, so, um, and then in Luke, there's a slight variation. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God in the highest. So he's king of Israel? Herod's king of Israel. Is this a treasonable activity? 
Yes, it is. Absolutely. So uh, it's all, you know, now the Jewish authorities have to deal with this. You know, this is not going to go well. Mark 11, verse 11. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when they had looked around at everything, it was already late. And he went out to Bethany with the 12. In Matthew, there's a further clarification. This is Matthew chapter 21, verses 10 to 17. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Galilee of Nazareth. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he cured them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the amazing things he did, and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry and said to him, do you hear what they are saying? Jesus said to them, yes, have you never heard and never read out of mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. He left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. Uh, very dangerous, very dangerous. Uh, who is this Jesus, this prophet from Nazareth? He enters the temple and cleanses the temple. Now there's all sorts of issues here. This is also found in John chapter two. Uh, this is found in Mark 11, 11 and Luke chapter 19, 45 to 46. This would have been the last straw. Now the cleansing of the temple happens first in John's gospel at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. But in the, in the synoptic tradition of Matthew, Mark and Luke, this is at the very end. So there's a different emphasis. This would have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Jesus's relationship to Sabbath law and healing on the Sabbath. Jesus' ability in his name, with his authority to take away sin, when only God in the Only Testament takes away sin. Uh, the fact of kosher, there's nothing from the outside going into you that can defile you but non-observance of Torah in the internal form coming out of you, what is what defiles a person. So the change of kosher. He wipes out ritualistic kosher, but emphasizes moral kosher, the internal form and strict obedience to Torah law. The issue of uh, binding and loosing the role of Jesus as a prophetic messenger articulating a certain interpretation of the Torah. And then of course the issues of Sabbath law and Jesus curing on the Sabbath, you know. So these are the things that got him into trouble and now he dare comes in as the son of David acting as if he's the long-awaited king of Israel, the long-awaited vindicator coming from God, this messianic leader coming in. And now even the children say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let the children speak the truth. 
He goes into the temple and drives out the money changers, which had to be there because you had to change Gentile money into Jewish liturgical money because Jewish coinage had the image of the emperor and the emperor was seen as a divine being. So it's idolatrous. You can't have something idolatrous going into sacred space, namely the temple. So you had to have money changers. So you would exchange Gentile money into Jewish money and that money would then be used to buy the things offered up in daily sacrifice. He cleanses the temple. He could not have done this on his own. This, this was an arm takeover. People, you know, we uh, see this, these, these uh, Jesus movies where he comes into the temple and he overthrows, overturns one or two tables and the coins spill out of their, uh, their, their pots or their trays or their bowls and money goes flying and that's the uh, cleansing of the temple. Not so. The temple precinct of the temple treasury was massive. It had many porticos, many. And, he sh and in, in John's gospel, he shut down the temple. He prohibited the buying of selling of articles to be offered up and sacrificed. Therefore, you shut down the temple sacrifice. You shut down the liturgical activity of Israel. You stop temple sacrifices. You can't do that. Jesus does. And, he, and what I'm saying is he, he could not have done it on his own. Could not have done it. If this was an arm table. The 12 apostles and others would have been there. Would they have flashed a few swords? Perhaps. Don't know. One thing is clear. Jesus and his disciples prohibited people from buying and selling. So he shut down the sacrificial activity of the temple. That was the last straw. We got to get rid of them. So after this is done, there's a certain time period. And then he allows the temple to be reopened and people could buy and sell and then be about the business of offering sacrifice. But this shows that he had control over the most sacred spot on the face of the earth in the mind of the Jew. At he, he stopped temple sacrifice. He took over the temple. Of course, in Luke's gospel, in the birth narratives, uh, the temple is the dwelling place of his father, God. Okay, among other places, but God, God's temple. This, this is his father's home. This is his father's temple. Therefore, he's home. This is his house. And you've turned it into a den of thieves by charging exorbitant prices on defective animals and those commodities offered up in sacrifice. So there was a violation of the virtue of justice, giving God the first fruits without blemish, and the, the violation of the justice by cheating the people. So not only do you cheat God by giving him defective commodities, you overcharge the people for these things. It's a form of extortion. So you cheat the people and you cheat God and you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. And Jesus will not put up with that. This is found in the uh, Matthean tradition as well as John, John chapter two. So it's very clear. This is my house, this is my father's house. And if it's my father's house, it's my house. 
I am the son of the father. Okay? And you dare profane it by a violation of the virtue of justice. You are cheating God. And you are cheating God's people. Of course, in John, he would take a rope, make it into some form of a whip, and then force the people out. A little bit of violent activity there. Is this our little peaceful Jesus acting in a rather upsetting way? Yes, it is. He's cleaning the temple. So you have to deal with that. Is this our lovely, sweet Jesus that we want Jesus to be always happy and never violent and never uh, getting upset to the point that he would use violence as a means of indicating God's wrath? That's not our little Jesus. Well, well, read the text. It is. Deal with it. Yes, it's a matter of interpretation. Yeah. There, there, are, there are some scholarships, which, which I read years ago, that would want to say this, did, this really didn't happen. It was more of a, of a, <coughs> as a literary motif used to discuss or to image God's wrath in the Old Testament. And God's wrath in the Old Testament is not becoming of Jesus in the New Testament. So they would say, this is a possible prophetic literary device that's used by the sacred writer to indicate the wrath of God statement. Wrath of God statements in the Old Testament are statements that say you broke covenant. And when you broke covenant, uh, some sort of punishment or some sort of reconciliation has to be in, enacted in some way. So, you know, uh, so wrath of God statements are judgment statements. Judgment statements means that you broke covenant, that, that you've done something against the 613 mitzvahs contained within the Torah. And God says, uh, no, you may not be, be uh, disobedient. And so uh, I'm making a judgment against you. And those are called wrath of God statements. They are judgment statements that say you broke covenant. And now the effects of breaking covenant are now going to be unleashed upon you. Classic Old Testament understanding of restitution. Okay. And uh, retribution too. And a, a lot of scholars don't think that's very becoming of the New Testament Jesus. Well, uh, this is where it's a matter of understanding what the text means. And I will simply end it with that. Okay, we're now on, uh, so Jesus retires and he goes to Bethany. Let's go to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. It was, it, it is two days before the Passover. See, all this takes place right before the, the most significant religious feast of Israel. It's the Passover. So it was two days before the Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread. And the chief priests and scribes were looking away to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him. So it's very clear about what they are about. For they said, not during the festival, or there might be a riot among the people. Well, they were thinking, yeah, uh, we, we really can't arrest Jesus right now. We will have an absolute revolution on our hands. So at this point, there's the meal that Jesus has with Martha and Mary in Bethany. Uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 3 to 9. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Simon was a leper, but now that he's been cured, so he's allowed to live in uh, habitational sites. 
if he if he was still a leper, he could not live in close proximity to a village. So while he was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he sat at table. A woman came in with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment over his head. But some who were there who said to one another in anger, why was this ointment wasted in this way? Well, this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her for it. But Jesus said to her, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed, ready? She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. So this is a precondition. This is a, uh, a prefigurement about his death. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed or the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. This is found in Mark and Matthew, and it's found in John. And when, and when it's found in John, it's Mary and Martha rather than Simon the leper's house. It's Mary and Martha's house. A little switch here. To continue, Mark chapter 14, 10 to 11. Then Judas Iscariot, who was the one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Mark 14, 12 to 16. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, the disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and make preparation for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples saying, go then, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you there. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, fully furnished and ready. Make preparation for us there. So the disciples sent out and went into the city, found everything as he told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. So we're at the Last Supper. There's the issue of Judas and the issue of who's going to betray Jesus and the issue of Peter's denial. You know, Jesus announces who is in fact going to betray him. He who dips his hand into the condiment dish and we share that dish. He's the one. And uh, in Mark chapter 14, 26 to 31. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is after the Last Supper. And Jesus said to them, you will all become deserters. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though all will become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly, namely, this is a teaching, verily, verily, or truly, truly. Truly, I tell you, this day, this very night, 
before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said this vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will never deny you. And all of them said the same. Okay. So at that point, dinner is ended. They go to a place called Gethsemane. Sit here while I want, sit here a while while I pray. He took them with Peter, James, and John, and he began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even unto death. Remain here and, and stay awake. And going down a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And he came, found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep one, wake one hour with me? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Okay, for well, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more, he came, found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said, Ah, uh, are you still sleeping? Well, Take your rest. Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So at this particular juncture, Jesus is now going to be arrested. Now, Israel's under Roman occupation. So he has to be brought to Gentiles, okay? So it's not enough to simply to be brought to the Jewish authorities. Everything's got to be funneled through the Roman Imperium. But before it does take place, uh, he has to appear before the Sanhedrin, okay? Which is the highest Jewish body. Okay, now they had no legitimate authority to execute except with the permission of Pilate. Okay, now there's all sorts of theories about this. There are times in which the Roman Imperium and whoever was governor of Judea would give a blanket permission for the Sanhedrin to execute people for disobedience to the Torah. And it and some governors gave a blanket permission that you may do whatever you wish, make judgments, not by Roman law, but by Torah law. And since that is the law of your land, you may follow suit. Other scholars say that that depending who was governor, you needed explicit permission. And this is those times in which they needed Pilate's permission because they could not exact capital punishment on their own authority. This is a very important issue. So Jesus is now taken captive. Okay. This is Mark chapter 14, 43 to 52. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived with him. There was a crowd with swords, clubs from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. It's pitch dark. They need lanterns. They need torches. Why? There's not enough light to see who we capture. So to make sure that they got the right person, 
it, it was arranged with, with, with the high priest and Judas Iscariot, the one that I kissed, that's the one you arrest. So this is not a matter of just a few people. No, this is a whole cohort with people, with clubs, torches, lanterns, etc., swords, and we are going to arrest this Jesus. So we got to make sure that we get the right person. We, we have been after Jesus for a long time. He's public enemy number one. Uh, and we have to make sure we have the right individual. Now, verse, uh, chapter 14, <coughs> verse 44. Now, the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he had came up to him at once, he said, Rabbi, and kissed him. And then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Interesting imagery here. That's Mark. And Matthew 26, verse 51. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on the sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my heavenly father, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then will the scripture be fulfilled, which says it must happen this way? And at that very hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out here with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not arrest me. But all this has now taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then the disciples deserted and fled. Jesus is now arrested. This gets into a very important principle. The capture, arrest, and death and trial of Jesus is not a mere historical accident. It's in the mind of God. It's not happenstance. It's not, oh, this is the way that it went and it could have, and it could have been done differently. No, uh, Matthew wants to make it very clear. This is prophesied. And the oracles contained within the prophetic tradition within the Tanakh or the Jewish Bible. Uh, this is prefigured. His death is not an accident. It's not some sort of historical mishap. No, ultimately this is in the mind of God. Now this does lead to some serious questions. How culpable was Judas? How culpable is the nation of Israel for the death of Jesus? How, how culpable was the planning of the high priest to, to arrest Jesus? How culpable is Pilate when he passes judgment, as well as Herod? You know, and this is some sort of God's divine providential plan. There's always gonna be the problem of human freedom and God's providence, God's will, God's prefigured will as seen in the prophetic tradition of Israel, and then the issue of human freedom. And human freedom is not illusory, it's genuine. So there's always gonna be that problem, you know? 
Uh, are we all actors on a play? How do we make sense of God's providential design before the foundation of the world ever took place? And the incarnation, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus as it relates to human freedom. You know, was Judas and the other players within this dynamic play uh, free of moral culpability? If you even want to raise that type of a question. So these are the things that's that scholars have been talking about for a very long time. So, yeah, uh, when you read Mark, you know, you, you read, you know, then Jesus said to them, have you come here out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I am a brigand? Uh, day after day, I sat with you in the temple teaching, and yet you did not arrest me there. Why, you know, why did you wait so long? What's the time sequence in this? Mark has Jesus saying, yeah, there, is, there is a real appointed time when God acts. And this is the appointed time, not before, and not later. So this is sacred time in the mind of God being acted out in human existential reality <laughs> within human history and the context of human history. But then in Mark, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. So there is a prophetic oracle. And then how do the apostles treat Jesus? All of them deserted and fled. Yeah. So here's Jesus, the would-be messianic goel and vindicator for Israel, the king of Israel, a few days earlier, triumphantly entering Jerusalem shutting down the temple precincts and the temple treasury, arrested, and now he's going to be led into trial. No. Is this a mere accident? Is this a mere historical accident where you can, where it could have been played out in many different ways? Well, studying from coming from sacred scripture, it seems as if this was in the mind of God as prophesied centuries earlier by prophetic oracle. Interesting. It's, it, it's really fascinating to ask this type of question. So Jesus is now taken captive and he now has to appear before the council, the Jewish council or the Jewish Sanhedrin. And he has to answer charges. That we'll get into later. I believe now it's time for question and answer. Jay, go ahead, please. Thank you, Father Jude. Uh, yes, we are moving on to the Q&A portion of our meeting at this time. Uh, it looks like we have a question already ready from Marcy. Marcy, if you would unmute and go ahead. Hi, Father. Hi, Marcy. So my question is, you know, I'm a logistics person and a planner. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I'm picturing God. He's got all this in his mind. And I mean, obviously, it's just perfectly divinely planned because of all the little details that you explained. So I'm thinking, how did Jesus know about this? Did Jesus... Did they sit down before he came to earth and have a little plan, a little powwow? Did they, you know, and then I think, okay, maybe when he goes out to the desert, like he's praying, that's when God is sharing with him, you know, what's going to happen or where it's going to go. But I think that's kind of interesting. And if it is when he's praying in the desert, I think 
gets interesting because in the Old Testament, um, we always hear of God talking. So Moses goes to the top of the mountain and the cloud comes in and they chat or the fire comes in and they chat or with Abraham, they chat. Like we hear about those discussions, but we don't hear about it with Jesus. No. Uh, so I just. Yeah. Uh, let me respond. First of all, uh, it deals with the nature of the incarnation. Uh, or, or what we call the pre-existence of the Logos. Uh, the Logos is the wisdom, the word, the very mind, the very soul of God. So in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. There was never any time in which the Logos was absent from the fatherhood of God and what we call the the uh, the uh, Holy Spirit. So for us Christians, it is a Trinitarian God, but God is one. So it's not a matter where once the incarnation of the pre-existent logos takes place, God has to have a conversation with himself. No, uh, God, <laughs> God is God. Knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so now, but now, the the logos of God, the word of God, the will of God, the law of God, the very soul of God, the very mind of God, is in human time, with human nature. So now we have to deal with okay, what does Jesus know about himself and his relationship yeah. to the Father once he takes on this new modality so it's a different right. mode of divine expression but god is still god and so i think for the human authorship for us because we live in time and god lives outside of time and it's instantaneous there is no past present or future in god it's it, it just simply god is and for us who are created entities, we need time because we are of matter and time is the measure of motion of matter. So once the incarnation takes place, God is now in time. See, And so however the divine will is expressed, it's now time related. But in a profound theological sense, uh, he is the pre-existent logos. And so there's never a time that he did not know. Because he's God. Wow. Now, yeah. So, but but the moment the logos takes on human nature, then there's a certain confinement, which he freely accepts. And and so this is why most scholars would say. When Jesus has to ask a question or pray, it's by accommodation. He is accommodating divine activity to human activity. And so he will act as if he's human, which he is human, because it's genuine human nature. But, right. see, and, 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 and this is where we get into all sorts of um, Christological uh, issues. Uh, you know, so you have Jesus with a divine intellect, divine will, but he also has human nature. So he has a human will and a human intellect. And what? And so, therefore, what's the correspondence? What is the interfacing of divine will with human will? So, <laughs> so when he's in the garden at Gethsemane. And he's suffering, and he knows that he's going to die a horrible death. And then he prays to the Father, Father, if it be your will, may this cup pass from me. But if it is your will that I drink this cup, then I will drink it. But not my will, your will. Well, this is the human writer saying, could there ever be a time in which 
Jesus's human will would would in any way contradict his divine will? And the answer is no. So the issue here is one of accommodation, that the human writer wants to show the full expression of the humanity of Jesus. And it's a real suffering because it's real humanity. And yet Jesus as the incarnated logos does not suffer. But his human nature, genuine human nature, does in fact suffer. And so, so there's always going to be that Christological debate that has been around for the first five centuries of church history. What was the relationship between the Logos and Jesus's human nature? Uh, and most, a lot of scholars believe he's, whenever he's praying to God or asking or, or doing this or that, it's by accommodation that he wants to say to us, what we go through he went through, and it's genuine. Thank you, Marcy. That, Mar Mar that makes sense. And that does make sense. Yes. And one quick question: How far yeah. is Bethany outside of Jerusalem? Oh, I have to walk that. That's about five miles, if that. Okay. If that, yeah. Thank you, Thank Marcy. You, Marcy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see if we have another question. If you have a uh, question for Father, go ahead and uh, raise your hand. Victor. Victor. Hello, oh, Father. Uh, do the, does the Torah, like in, let's say, Zechariah or the Psalms, do they, they refer to the prophet and the Savior, the Messiah, correct? Yes. Okay. And do they indicate that he's going to suffer or be sacrificed? Yes. Uh, when you read the book of the prophet Isaiah, it's like another gospel uh, uh, with the Psalms. Um, the uh, uh, one thing about, for example, when you read the gospel of Luke on Easter Sunday evening, when Jesus is having that conversation with the two disciples on, on the road to Emmaus. It is abundantly clear in Luke's gospel that the hermeneutical method or the method that one uses to understand Jesus's relationship to ancient Israel is through the reading of law, prophecy, and wisdom writings. That is the method by which we interpret or how the early church tried to interpret Jesus's role with the historicity of Israel. Uh, you can only understand it by reading the law and the prophetic tradition, most especially Isaiah and, and uh, Jeremiah. Uh, from our perspective, when you have the suffering servant theme in the prophetic tradition, uh, we say that is in relationship to the long awaited Messiah. Contemporary Judaism would say the suffering servant image relates to Israel, not necessarily to the Messiah. So we have a different hermeneutical stance in that regard. Thank okay. you for your question, Victor. Thank you, Victor. Uh, do, uh, does anyone else have a question this morning? Linda. It's about the passion. Go ahead. So I just, I always wondered what it was and I'm sorry, I, I just looked it up and it, and it means suffering which was, and I was surprised that was the meaning of it. But my question initially was, it, I learned that it had to do with the arrest, the trial and the crucifixion. But, and then you just said Gethsemane and I was thinking in the garden of Gethsemane, that's part of it. 
yeah it, resurrection it depends on where you want to start it you okay. know yeah so uh to, um depending on what translation of sacred scripture you are reading uh the passion or the suffering of the messiah begins when he is is arrested uh, right after the last supper okay yeah yeah but what does the resurrection have to, how does that ex, how does the uh, resurrection explain? that's after the passion that's after the passion okay and so in order to understand the resurrection you really cannot um separate it from the passion okay thank okay. you okay thank you thank you thanks linda um mm -hmm. Uh, Virginia, and then that'll be our last question this morning. Go ahead, Virginia. Father, why do some people uh, blame the Jews and persecute them? Because well, of for, yeah, uh, that's a horrible thing. Yeah, uh, you know, someone's got to find the scapegoat. You know, uh, it, um, one thing is very clear. The church in its, in its recent documents, most especially coming from Vatican II and then post-Vatican II documentation, uh, 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 sin kills Jesus. Uh, evil kills Jesus. Uh, the Jews, uh, the Romans, uh, yes, historically, they've been accused as as the means by which this takes place. But again, uh, uh, the uh, church makes it very clear, oh, did the Jews kill Jesus? Well, they are a means to an end. Sin kills Jesus, evil kills Jesus. And so, and the church makes it very clear, you are not to blame the Jews today for the Jews action 2000 years ago. Ultimately, this is God's uh, providential plan here. But to call the uh, Jews as Christ killers and all that, that makes no sense for us today whatsoever. Jesus comes to, to destroy the kingdom of Satan and the effects of Satan. And the ultimate effect of Satan is death. And Jesus destroys death. And in doing so, destroys evil. So rather than saying, well, how are the Jews related to the passion, death, and resurrection? That's a whole another question. Um, it, it isn't just the Jews. It's humanity's inability to elect freely God in their lives. It's not just the Jews. It's everyone. Sin kills Jesus. And it's not some form of historical accident. No, it's in the very mind of God. So Jesus doesn't just simply redeem the, the children of Israel. He redeems all of humanity, all of it, because all humanity sinned under Adam and Eve. And that's why he is sent, to have that reconciliation. Now, it is true, yeah, someone had to be, some people, someone had to be a dynamic player within the passion, of course, you know, yeah, okay. But it's not just the Jews, it's the Romans, it's everyone. Don't forget that last line of Mark, Jesus is rejected by his people, deserted by his disciples and then arrested he's completely alone those that knew him those that loved him his own people his, his own followers when he was arrested he's now alone so so it's not a matter of blaming this or that people no 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 we are all held responsible because sin is universal. It comes from Adam. So therefore, it's sin that has Jesus killed. And it's sin that is annihilated 
by Christ's death and resurrection. Okay? Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, Jay. Okay, very good. All right, it looks like we've reached the top of the hour. So um, just wanna thank you all for joining us this morning and we hope that you can join us this evening. And thank you, Father Jude, for the talk. And we hope all of you have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Take care, folks. God bless.